go and watch all these videos and compare and contrast and go and read all these interviews. I mean, it's easy to do the research now. Back then, not so much. Yeah. But, um, but I think people are probably just more naive and more gullible, and they didn't know about this sort of a psyop, that this mm -hmm. sort of thing would even be possible or that somebody would even conceive of such an evil agenda. But now, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's also tell the story about what you think happened uh, in Seattle. And you you mentioned to me about something about uh, Paul's body being uh, potentially dumped into Puget Sound. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. that. Oh, uh, well, I mean, like I said, a lot of this information I got, I channeled. But if you go and watch uh, Braverman's Condensed Cream of the Beatles, that is a movie from 1974. It's a cartoon, and it's creepy as heck. <laughs> it's like, why do they have this creepy video or movie of Paul basically being killed, being assassinated, being in a horrible car accident, being shot, and being dumped in the water. Like, what is that? And then it's made by Pyramid Films, and which was obviously Illuminati. Interesting. So I think that, yeah, I think that movie is basically telling you the story of what happened. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. That's, a, that's an animated film? Is that what it was? Yes. Okay. It has very disturbing imagery, and it has, like, for example, it has... Um, Car, a car chase, car crash, fiery car crash. Oh. A gun shot through a window. A gun held to dog's head. A body being pulled out of the water. A, it looks like a dead Paul. I mean, a picture is from Paul in a swimming pool. That, they, and it, you know, he kind of his eyes were closed, but they used it kind of in a in the context. It seems like he could be dead from in the water. It's I you just have to say it. It looks really creepy. Yeah. Um, so why do they take that picture of all the pictures, you know? And then it has, a, you know, like a snake imagery. And it has somebody with a drum in their mouth, like a, a warning to keep silent. Oh. Like that's a symbol for silence, right? Yes. And, um, and then, like, the pyramid, the Illuminati connection, too. So it's, it's weird. I think they're telling you. And... There was a lot of symbolism that I think tells you what happened. So, you know, I I think there's a lot of disinformation of people trying to spread, like, um, like it was a simple accident. I think that's disinformation because, well, actually, I think there are several layers of disinformation because uh, the first one is that it's the same Paul and nothing ever happened, mm -hmm. which is dumb. And then the next is, well, it was, a, it was an accident. Oh, no, actually, there was the one where, oh, he just didn't want to be a rock star anymore, so he ran off and let somebody else take his place. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens every day, right? Cool story, but I'll tell it again. And then there's the one where, oh, he died in a, he just had a simple car accident, and and then they were so upset that they just found somebody to replace their friend. Which is kind of dumb, too, because who does that? Um, and then there's, well, maybe he was killed, but it was the Ku Klux Klan who did it. Yeah, that's it. It's like, okay, well, the KKK had the clout to control the media on this, and for 50 years they're still controlling the media story and spin. I don't think so. Oh, so, so basically, in other words, you're, you're saying the KKK, because they were against segregation as the Beatles, in other words, and... That's why the KKK would would be have motivation to do that. Well, I'm not saying the KKK didn't have motivation, and they were openly making threats against the Beatles. I'm saying that they were. Uh, that's one level of the disinformation that, if it were ever to come out, that they could be blamed for it as like ah. a, a convenient scapegoat. That Got it. they don't have the clout. They don't have the power to pull it off. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Do 
you see what I'm saying? Like, this has to be a very high up operation with people with a lot of power. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Well, and the whole idea that um, that this was either an accident or it was planned or whatever, um, there were so many interesting, strange clues. Like you mentioned the um, uh, Sergeant Pepper, you know, album cover. Um, there are also the reverse masking. What do you call that again in the Beatles uh, songs themselves? When you, of course, a lot of people don't realize this is if they're young. The actual discs, you know, the platters, you put that on a record player. When you, when you turn them backwards, you actually uh, could have uh, could hear some some messages being played when the uh, the record was going in reverse. Yeah, that's right. So there are two different things that go on. There's back masking, and there's a reverse speech. Back masking is intentionally putting something in backwards, like um playing it backwards in a in a recording. And there is evidence of backmasking, for example, in Revelation number nine. It is the story, if you listen to it backwards, it is basically the story of a terrible car accident, whatever happened, you know, it's um so you can hear sounds of a car accident, a fire, funerary music all sorts of things. And but then there's also reverse speech, which is an unintentional um, re- revelation of the truth that conscious the, the conscious mind apparently will communicate forward and backwards. So if you say something forward and if you if somebody plays it backwards, the the backward message that comes out will actually reveal the truth. So there's an Australian researcher named David John Oates who has pioneered this research, and it actually has scientific merit. Um, Police in Oregon have actually used it in their investigations to help them. So there's tons of reverse speech in Beatles songs pertaining to Paul's murder and replacement. You, like, you want to mention a couple, Yeah, you want to mention a couple of them so people can uh, look it up or oh, listen to them there's themselves. There's so many. There's so many. Like, I'm the Walrus has Mac is new. Um, you know, like a new McCartney. Um, Helder Skelter has Paul is dead. I like death. <laughs> you know, um, God, there's so many. Um, I don't so know, I mean, they're, they're in the book. They're, they're in the they're in the book. They're in the book, so people could actually uh, look at some of those uh, references that you're talking about. Oh. Right? Yeah, and I mean, it's the same story. It's the same story of being killed and replaced. You know, it's if you listen to, for example, like uh, Saint Paul, the reverse speech on that is, and that song is from by Terry Knight, but it is about. Paul McCartney, apparently, that it has, like, miss him, miss him, miss him, and Paul's dad, and, like, all this stuff in it. (coughs) Sorry. I'm losing my voice. Uh But, anyway, so, I mean, it's basically the story that it backs up what I, what I got (laughs) about what happened. Yeah. Now, let's, um, that kind of brings up the whole idea now of the um, voice print analysis that was done as well that you talk about and uh, in your book. You want to get to that subject at this point? Yeah. So you know, uh, voice print analysis that is a a tool that can be used to identify doubles because your voice print is unique. And so back in 1969, Dr. Henry Truby from the University of Miami, he pioneered voice print um, research, and he was an expert in it. He, uh, he started to examine Beatles songs at the request of Roby Young, who was a broadcaster and was the first 
one of the first ones to announce Pell is dead back in 1969. Anyway, so Dr. Shruby went through all these Beatles songs, and he found that on songs that were supposedly sung by Paul, there are three different voices. So yesterday, Penny Lane and Hey Jude, for example, were three different voices. These songs were all supposedly done, sung by Paul. <coughs> so yesterday was 1965. Okay, that's the role of Paul McCartney. And then Penny Lane was 67, one voice double. And Hey Jude was 1968, a second voice double. We don't really know who these voice doubles were. And sometimes I think maybe Denny Lane could have been used as a voice double. I mean, Penny Lane seems to have that pretty strongly. And uh, Denny Lane was um, famous in his own right as one of the Moody Blues, and he had a big hit with Go Now. And wouldn't it be surprising if they tried to get some some of the singers to go in and fill in for for Paul, you know. And then with the voice, I'm sorry, with the studio magic, they could uh, tweak the voice to make it sound more like Paul. But the voice prints are still going to show that it's not Paul, and that's that's what happened. So uh, that's pretty conclusive right there. That at least it's not the, the singer. It's not Paul singing after 66. Yeah, so, so except, in other words... Except she's... Except She's Leaving Home was Paul, and that song was from 67 on Sgt. Pepper. So the thing is that Paul had said that he recorded everything he wrote. So he, you know, had a lot of songs that he wrote that had yet to be put on albums. I mean, even in his very first interview back in 63, you know, he said they had written like 100 songs and they had only used some of them because they were prolific. So you could take those songs and put them on later albums, like distribute them and kind of make it seem like Paul was still around. Yes, right. That because yeah. Exactly, because uh, you, you just mentioned that Paul McCartney was so prolific as a songwriter um, and uh, that, you know, basically the Beatles were were using his songs for quite a long time, um, maybe even after he was dead, because he had such a backlog of this creativity. Right, exactly. So, I mean, even, I this is a weird thing that Ringo said, that by Abbey Road, their, their writers weren't writing their songs anymore. It was kind of cryptic. It's like, what does that mean? Who's writing their songs? And are they using... Paul's leftover stuff to make up the Abbey Road medley. Like these were unfinished songs that Paul had just maybe started. Well, it was like string a bunch of Paul stuff together. You know? Well, you know, <laughs> that, know kind of that really makes sense to me because I have always thought that back in the old days when, the, when I was a young kid listening to some of the Beatles uh, stuff, not the live stuff, but, you know, the studio stuff that they came up with later on, when they didn't uh, perform live any longer, I, I, you would swear that there were four or five songs that made into one tune, or at least one recording, that uh, they were totally different parts. Of it. I mean, the, the song didn't flow like a normal you know, song does with uh, you know, the, the, the verse and the chorus and the bridge and you know, the chorus. Uh, they were very different stuff, so it would, be, it would make a lot of sense that they used some of that stuff just thrown together uh, to come up with uh, something new uh, that were that Paul McCartney had done in the past. Yeah, and and actually, I was watching something a long time ago with George Martin, who was their producer, and he was talking about a day in the life. He said we wanted to do something by Paul, and so they used that you know look at fell out of bed part like that real short part. And I was like, well, they want to use something by Paul. Why don't they just get Paul to write a song? <laughs> well, maybe they couldn't get Paul to write a song anymore. <laughs> you know? They just had this little part. Okay, we'll just throw that in there. Because it doesn't really fit in the song. It's kind of a weird 
it's just yeah. kind of, I don't know. I think it's kind of a weird thing to throw in there, kind of random. And it and it is kind of interesting the fact that some of those. Fun-